uh, nine o'clock UK time, about an hour and a half from now. Hi, Namurla, welcome to class. It's lovely to have you, brilliant. I am Helen and I'm joining you from the UK. Brilliant. So just to check, can you see my screen and can you hear me? Please type yes or no in the chat box. Let me know that you're there and you can see and hear okay or you can give me a thumbs up. Thank you, Esha. Thank you, Ahad. Wonderful. Brilliant. Okay, so just to say the chat box, please set it to everyone and then the teacher and other students can see it and use it for writing answers and questions uh, to really talk to each other today. I won't be able to take so many direct questions. Um, so I'm Helen and welcome now to our friends on YouTube who are joining us. And if you'd like more practice, this is just to say who we are. E2 Test Prep is an OET all-star and premium provider. And we've completed training to demonstrate the high quality of our courses and supported to deliver regular live classes on OET social media, as well as our own channels. And this lesson now is going out on our E2 channels too. It's an introduction to listening part A, which we offer every week. And if you'd like to continue learning about this or other OET preparation, you can find out more about our courses at www.e2language.com. So let's get straight into it. In today's live class, we're going to test your knowledge of medical and layman terminology. We'll learn the structure of part A, so you know what to do in the exam. We'll learn some strategies for completing part A and practice some gap fill strategies. And finally, we're going to examine a transcript. Now, it will be a bit of a fast and furious pace because we've just got half an hour today. Um, so if you would like to join, please grab a pen and paper or open a document. We'll do a quiz in a moment, but first let's review some vocabulary. Okay. Now, informal language is really important in listening part A because you're going to be hearing patients talking and patients often use phrasal verbs when explaining their needs, their illnesses and conditions. So take a, a moment and look at these phrasal verbs here. Take after, get around, fight off, let up, clogged up. See if you can... Uh, say what they mean okay so I'm going to look in the chat see what we're saying here what do they mean any thoughts okay so take out take after to resemble a parent or relative I guess I take after my father he was overweight his entire life get around means to move about for example it's difficult with these crutches but I managed to get around independently Fight off. I think we all know this, especially those of you who are fighting off colds at the moment. I've been trying to fight off this cold now for over a week. Let up means to diminish in severity. This pain in my stomach just won't let up. Clogged up. This is bad news. I need a, a strong decongestant. My nose is really clogged up. People talk about clogged up arteries as well. When something is obstructed, OK, so these kind of words are really useful and equally useful is vocabulary to recognize the difference between medical and lay terms. So here we've got some medical terms. Um, see if you can think of what the patient might say to describe these. What might the patient say for malaise, nausea, palpitations, recuperate and tremor? What might the patient say? How might they describe it? OK, malaise here. They might say words like fatigued or feeling awful. Nausea, feeling sick or uncomfortable in the stomach. Palpitations, when your heart is racing or beating quickly. Recuperate. You might see feeling better or um, being up and about. And tremor. We might hear the words shaking, shaking in the hands. OK, so you can go back to those and review them later. But let's start to talk about listening part A and an overview of it. So what happens in listening part A? Well, you're going to hear 
two different extracts, workplace consultations. There'll be 24 questions, 12 questions per extract. And each one lasts four to five minutes. And you need to do quite a lot, right? Because you're only gonna hear the audio just the once. You need to comprehend, interpret, accurately record detailed information to complete a set of structured notes. And when I do these listening aid tutorials, people often say to me, I just find it hard to keep up with the audio and write down everything. And indeed, that's something you should really work on because this is a part of the test where you're writing and you want to make sure that you are writing down the words accurately and clearly. Here is an example of the layout you'll see in the exam. Okay, so for example, we've got the first three questions are answered with the words 48 hours, taste and tiredness. And they relate to the history of the condition. And you can see you've got these partially completed notes. So question one, first symptoms, approximately 48 hours after giving birth, eight months ago. Question two is answered with taste, the partial loss of sense of taste. And there's the hint on the left side. And number three, attributed to tiredness after childbirth. So in the pre-listening time, you get a bit of time to predict what words are going to come up. And this is really useful to get right. You're gonna use this time to read quickly through the headings and think about the types of words that may fit. You're also gonna think about the spoken language versus the written language. As we did in that little quiz at the start, informal versus formal language. And of course, you want to be good at identifying the meaning of informal language. You also want to try to read all the information. And you can start with the headings and the bullet points, but you do want to try to get a good overview of what is coming and to anticipate what types of words are going to fit into those answer gaps. Now, when you read and predict or anticipate, it helps you tune in to the topic. So you're ready to listen for and pick out the relevant information. It's a bit like if you're tuning in a radio and you're listening to different channels and you're trying to find the channel that you want. Now, I know this is an old example because we often go straight to podcasts these days, don't we? But when you were tuning in a radio years ago, when you're tuning in a radio, you will take a few seconds to tune in and try and say, okay, what am I listening to here? Now, OET gives you 30 seconds to help prepare your mind for what's coming. Let's have a look at uh, another example. So here we've got the patient, here's the subheading. And if you listen for that patient's name at the start, it will help you focus. You'll always know the patient's name. In this case, the patient's name is Declan Bassett. You'll often see time references in the notes. Now they are your friend because they will help you. It's easy to hear numbers. They tend to stand out both in the text and when you are listening, you tend to hear them and they often organize the notes and the conversation. So here three years ago is a good hook for you. And you see that's connected to the episodes of vomiting. Now here we have a gap, but we can anticipate that this will be the name of a medical condition. Now, if anyone in the chat can tell me what might be the missing word there for 13. Anyone in E2 in our chat here, can you tell me what might be the missing word for number 13? Uh, for number 14, yeah, Nino's saying good. Uh, for number 14, well, we've got the verb prescribed afterwards and the hint it was ineffective, um, but it will probably be the name of a medication. Yeah, exactly, Ahmed is saying that. 
Okay, now it probably won't just be medication. It might actually be the name of a medication. Does anyone want to take a guess what it might be? Given the other things that are written there, any other ideas there? Our students at E2 are suggesting malaria and gastritis as well. Omeprazole is uh, being offered, antacids is offered. Um, yeah, PPI, yeah, we've got some interesting suggestions coming in here. So that's what you're doing. You're trying to bring up parts of uh, your existing knowledge, okay? Um, working with healthcare, what might you see? It's really important that you do that. Okay, so now we've got the word endoscopy, but we know that the patient is talking. So the endoscopy relates to the notes written by the the doctor or the healthcare provider. Here we've got endoscopy. This technical term might be paraphrased. It might be paraphrased. It might be something else. Okay, so you also need to be flexible. And we can see that synonyms appear as well. For antibiotics, perhaps we might have a synonym for antibiotic. It might just be medication in this case. We don't know. Okay, so you need to be flexible. Okay, some examples there of uh, paraphrased words at the bottom. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's actually um, try to predict what the missing words are. We'll take 30 seconds. Okay, I'm just going to have a quick look in the chat and see if anyone's had any suggestions. Okay, one student saying peptic ulcer disease. Okay, any other suggestions or thoughts? Sometimes people put the whole list in <laughs> in our classes, not today. All right, so now let's have a think about how we're going to predict. I want to give you another few hints. So you'll see the block of text. Okay. And here's a redacted version, a shortened version of what you'll hear. Okay, now sometimes the same words appear, excuse me, and sometimes synonyms are used. So for example, history of the condition is something said by the, um, well, actually by the doctor. There it's written exactly the same. Three years ago, we're gonna hear that and it's written as well. But when we come to the word vomiting, well, we see that's paraphrased, right? I was having issues keeping food and drink down. Keeping something down means not vomiting. And the patient says, I was having issues keeping food and drink down. So that's an example of paraphrase. All right. We've got prescribed. Well, that's exactly the same. We've got they didn't work. Well, that matches ineffective. There it's a paraphrase. Problem with the bacteria, okay, is paraphrased from bacterial imbalance. Endoscopy, well, they say that. An antibiotic is said exactly the same. Um, I did feel a bit better. Well, that matches led to some relief from symptoms, right? So this is a, a nice example to see how the Words you will hear are sometimes the same, but they're sometimes going to be paraphrased to those written on your exam paper. You need to be flexible. So some tips here. In the first 15 or 20 seconds of speech before the first question, of course, you'll be nervous, but you can use this time, okay? Use this time to give yourself a purpose for listening. Try to understand the entire consultation. Be ready to use the headings and bullet points to follow along. 
And you know, remember that the answers will come from the patient, but signposts will usually come from the doctor or the professional, okay? Are you ready? Let's try one together. I think we should just do this now. Okay, so let's do it. So Declan, you've been referred to me because you've been experiencing digestive problems. Before I examine you, perhaps you could tell me in your own words the history of the condition. Well, it all started about three years ago. Uh, I suddenly found I was having issues keeping food and drink down. So I went to the doctor and he said, well, what you're describing, it sounds like acid reflux. Uh, well, I'd heard of that and I didn't think that's what it was. Uh, anyway, he prescribed a course of H2 receptor blockers and said, uh, just try and if this doesn't work, then we'll schedule some tests. And? Well, I was right to be sceptical because they didn't work. So I ended up going for an endoscopy, and my GP was surprised. He said, you were right, there is something else going on. Mm. Uh, they'd taken a biopsy of my stomach, and there was a problem with the bacteria there. So he put me on a triple antibiotic, and I was on that for 21 days. And did that help? Uh, I did feel a bit better, but if I ate certain foods, they'd still get stuck in my throat. Uh, like when I was eating bread, that sort of thing. Mm. Then fast forward to this time last year and I had the same episode again. I just couldn't keep the food down. Only this time it wasn't only that. I also had a feeling like my stomach was burning. Uh, it was horrible, like my insides were on fire or something. Mm. Um, I thought it would pass like the other symptoms did, but actually it just got more and more intense. So I called the hospital and the paramedics came out to get me. Mm. So what happened there? Uh, well, they did some tests. Uh, they took a stool sample uh, and they told me they were going to analyse that to see what was going on down there. Uh, anyway, eventually I was told I'd been diagnosed with colitis and again was prescribed antibiotics. So I took them, but within an hour or two of taking those pills, I was throwing up again. Right. <laughs> Uh, so I ended up back in hospital because I couldn't keep anything down and I was really suffering from fatigue. Mm. I was having trouble even standing at this point and basically everything hurt. So they admitted me and put me on an IV for fluids because I was dehydrated and malnourished. And they did more tests? Yes, uh, this time they gave me a barium swallow test and took an x-ray of my chest area. What that showed was that I had a disorder in my esophagus. Uh, basically, the endings of the nerve cells are supposed to move the food down my esophagus to my stomach, uh, and so signal to my LES muscle to relax and allow the food into my stomach. But because these nerves aren't working, there's no signal and the muscle doesn't open. So they diagnosed achalasia? That's right. They told Okay, so I'm, I just had something a little bit odd happen here. Sorry about that. Let me just come back. I'm just going to pause it here. Okay, so we've got to number 21. I've got a slight technical challenge here. I'm going to stop at 21 and we'll come back if I can to the others. Okay. Now, here's an example of some incorrect answers, okay? Some answers that didn't come out quite right. So I'll give you a few minutes, or a, let's say two minutes, have a look at these incorrect answers and see if you can identify what might be wrong here. What might be wrong? Oh, okay, something strange has just stopped on, happened on my side. I'm sorry about this. I've just had to um, briefly stop because my, I've had an issue here, okay. Yeah. 
sometimes this happens. If you can just pause for a moment, I've stopped my screen, just be patient. Yeah, we've had a poor connection issue coming here, but I can see, I'm just gonna keep talking through for a minute and we'll see if we can fix it on our side. Thank you for your patience. All right, so thank you for waiting. I can see we've still got 72 back here. Um, and thank you <clears throat> for those of you who've um, been patient and waited as well. Thank you, Mads. <laughs> <clears throat> we've got an enthusiastic yay from E2, brilliant, thank you. So I think I will just play this audio one more time just because this could then be a new video, okay. Hold on a second. So I'm gonna play this again. Thank you for waiting. And I'm gonna play this audio one more time, okay. So Declan, you've been referred to me because you've been experiencing digestive problems. Before I examine you, perhaps you could tell me in your own words, the history of the condition. 
Well, it all started about three years ago. Uh, I suddenly found I was having issues keeping food and drink down. So I went to the doctor and he said, well, what you're describing, it sounds like acid reflux. Uh, well, I'd heard of that and I didn't think that's what it was. Uh, anyway, he prescribed a course of H2 receptor blockers and said, uh, just try and if this doesn't work, then we'll schedule some tests. And... Well, I was right to be sceptical because they didn't work. So I ended up going for an endoscopy and my GP was surprised. He said, you were right, there is something else going on. Mm. Uh, they'd taken a biopsy of my stomach and there was a problem with the bacteria there. So he put me on a triple antibiotic and I was on that for 21 days. And did that help? Uh, I did feel a bit better, but if I ate certain foods, they'd still get stuck in my throat. Uh, like when I was eating bread, that sort of thing. Mm. Then fast forward to this time last year, and I had the same episode again. I just couldn't keep the food down. Only this time, it wasn't only that. I also had a feeling like my stomach was burning. Uh, it was horrible, like my insides were on fire or something. Mm. Um, I thought it would pass like the other symptoms did, but actually it just got more and more intense, so I called the hospital and the paramedics came out to get me. Mm. So what happened there? Uh, well, they did some tests, uh, they took a stool sample uh, and they told me they were going to analyse that to see what was going on down there. Uh, anyway, eventually I was told I'd been diagnosed with colitis and again was prescribed antibiotics. So I took them, but within an hour or two of taking those pills, I was throwing up again. Right. Uh, so I ended up back in hospital because I couldn't keep anything down, and I was really suffering from fatigue. Mm. I was having trouble even standing at this point, and basically everything hurt. So they admitted me and put me on an IV for fluids because I was dehydrated and malnourished. And they did more tests? Yes. Uh, this time they gave me a barium swallow test and took an X-ray of my chest area. What that showed was that I had a disorder in my esophagus. Uh, basically, the endings of the nerve cells are supposed to move the food down my esophagus to my stomach. Uh, and so signal to my LES muscle to relax and allow the food into my stomach. But because these nerves aren't working, there's no signal and the muscle doesn't open. So they diagnosed achalasia? That's right. They told me I'd have to manage the condition somehow. Um, I mean, that's OK, because it's not all the time. I have these episodes where I can't keep anything down, then, for a while, I'm OK, as long as I'm careful. I keep to a mostly liquid diet, or go for food that's easy to break down. Uh, I watch the texture of the solid stuff I eat and keep to small portions. Uh, another thing that's helped is having carbonated drinks at mealtimes, because burping helps to get the LES working. <laughs> that's right. OK, well, I think I've got the picture now. Next, I'd like to ask what you're hoping I can do for you. Well, I was looking on the internet and I saw that there's a new form of surgery that's been developed that might make a difference to me. Uh, my GP said you'd be able to tell me about that. OK, well, let's begin by analysing. All right, so happy to be back. And we were at this point here looking at some incorrect answers. People often ask me in tutorials, will this answer be acceptable? Are spelling errors acceptable, uh, et cetera? So this is a chance to think about those things. I'll give you uh, 30 seconds just to look over these errors and see if you can correct them. OK, so we've got some good answers coming in here. Thank you very much, uh, Jenilyn. Um, hopefully we'll have another chance to listen to 23 and 24. Right, so 13, 13, Jenilyn, you've said should be acid reflux. Yes, good. 14, receptor blockers should be 
H2 receptor blockers. Okay, so this is missing information here. Now, 15, unfortunately, is misspelled. It should be bread spelled B-R-E-A-D. Yeah? Now, because bread is a common word, we want it to be spelled correctly because the OET is reflecting your ability to work in an English speaking environment and to spell words correctly, especially common words. So unfortunately, if you didn't get that word spelled correctly, you would lose the point. OK, 16 should be burning. That's the correct phrasing. And 17, the word form is not intensity, but intense. We want the adjective there. 18, it should be stool sample, just part of the stool. 19, it's colitis. A lot of people have said that in the chat here at E2. Inflammation, the incorrect answer is a symptom, but the disease is colitis. 20, is the wrong word form. 20 should not be fatigue, but as Ahmed is saying and Oluwakami is saying, fatigue. And 21 should be barium swallow test. That's the correct name. 22 is a, just a wrong word. Texture is correct, not textile. There's the correct word, texture. 23, the correct word form is burping. And again, the word form in 24 should be surgery. OK, that's the noun. So these are some examples of errors which are close, but they, unfortunately, you wouldn't get the point if you wrote uh, those incorrect answers. So do work on your accuracy as you are practicing. And this is something that we do in our sessions in E2. Here are the answers for you. You can uh, check against the ones you've written down later. And what we'll do now is we'll just listen. And what we can do is look at a transcript. And I'm going to highlight to you, I'm going to highlight to you where the answers are coming. OK. Yeah, let's try it. So, Declan. You've been referred to me because you've been experiencing digestive problems. Before I examine you, perhaps you could tell me in your own words the history of the condition. Well, it all started about three years ago. Uh, I suddenly found I was having issues keeping food and drink down. So I went to the doctor and he said, well, what you're describing, it sounds like acid reflux. Uh, well, I'd heard of that and I didn't think that's what it was. Uh, Anyway, he prescribed a course of H2 receptor blockers and said, just try, and if this doesn't work, then we'll schedule some tests. And? Well, I was right to be sceptical because they didn't work. So I ended up going for an endoscopy, and my GP was surprised. He said, you were right, there is something else going on. Mm. Uh, they'd taken a biopsy of my stomach, and there was a problem with the bacteria there. So he put me on a triple antibiotic, and I was on that for 21 days. And did that help? Uh, I did feel a bit better, but if I ate certain foods, they'd still get stuck in my throat. Uh, like when I was eating bread, that sort of thing. Mm. Then fast forward to this time last year, and I had the same episode again. I just couldn't keep the food down. Only this time, it wasn't only that. I also had a feeling like my stomach was burning. Uh, it was horrible, like my insides were on fire or something. Mm. Um, I thought it would pass like the other symptoms did, but actually it just got more and more intense. So I called the hospital and the paramedics came out to get me. Mm. So what happened there? Uh, well, they did some tests. Uh, they took a stool sample uh, and they told me they were going to analyse that to see what was going on down there. Anyway, eventually I was told I'd been diagnosed with colitis and, again, was prescribed antibiotics. So I took them, but within an hour or two of taking those pills, I was throwing up again. Right. So I ended up back in hospital because I couldn't keep anything down and I was really suffering from fatigue. Mm -hmm. I was having trouble even standing at this point, and basically everything hurt. 
So they admitted me and put me on an IV for fluids because I was dehydrated and malnourished. And they did more tests? Yes. Uh, this time they gave me a barium swallow test and took an X-ray of my chest area. What that showed was that I had a disorder in my esophagus. Uh, basically, the endings of the nerve cells are supposed to move the food down my esophagus to my stomach. Uh, and so signal to my LES muscle to relax and allow the food into my stomach. But because these nerves aren't working, there's no signal and the muscle doesn't open. So they diagnosed achalasia? That's right. They told me I'd have to manage the condition somehow. Um, I mean, that's OK, because it's not all the time. I have these episodes where I can't keep anything down, then for a while I'm okay as long as I'm careful. I keep to a mostly liquid diet or go for food that's easy to break down. Uh, I watch the texture of the solid stuff I eat and keep to small portions. Uh, another thing that's helped is having carbonated drinks at mealtimes because burping helps to get the LES working. <laughs> that's right. Okay, well, I think I've got the picture now. Next, I'd like to ask what you're hoping I can do for you. Well, I was looking on the internet and I saw that there's a new form of surgery that's been... So, Declan, okay, so there you've been is. referred to me. Be pause there. Okay, so what you um, saw there was a transcript, yeah? And you can look at this again and see if you can identify how the words in the transcript match up to the words on the exam paper. And that's a really useful exercise to do. Now, remember, the patient usually provides the answers. You're going to use the headings and bullet points to keep up. Try to write down exactly what you hear. Remember those um, oops answers, those incorrect answers often came from not writing down exactly what was said. Finally, if you miss an answer, do move on. Keep up with the text. At the end, you've got two minutes to quickly guess any answers you may have missed. I'm just having a look in E2. Evan said it, it was hard to hear the burp here, yes. But we've got some good uh, scores here. People are saying they've got 10, 9, 8. Well done. Good job, everybody. Now, quick quiz just to finish. OK, so I will read you these and see if you can um, listen and hear the missing word. Number one, I was right to be sceptical because they didn't work. Number two, they'd taken a biopsy of my stomach and there was a problem with the bacteria. Number three, I had the same episode again. I just couldn't keep the food down. Number four, the endings of the nerve cells are supposed to move the food down my esophagus. Five, another thing that's helped is having carbonated drinks at mealtimes. So I'll give you 15 seconds to see if you can see the answers. Oh, well done, Cleo. Wow, Cleo's got all of them. Brilliant. So we've got sceptical, biopsy, episode, nerve cells, and carbonated. All right, so well done there. Now, I'm sorry about the, the brief technical um, issue here, but thank you very much for, for staying and working with us. If you've enjoyed this kind of session, then I'd like to share with you that we are now celebrating over 2 million students who've successfully passed their English exams with OET. And to thank you for your support, please enjoy 20% off test prep packages and add-ons. And the code thank you, thank 20 is there. <clears throat> now, a comprehensive library of practice questions and quality exam resources will advance your skills in listening, reading, writing, and speaking. <clears throat> you can purchase a package with 20% off and get access to unlimited practice questions that mirror the exam format unlimited live classes with OET experts and past examiners, and a mock test as well here, um, which is really popular, and it tests your readiness for the real exam. 
and the assessments come with fast and expert feedback. So I'll leave the thank you code, thank you 20 up there. Um, and I want to say thank you for being patient and staying with us. And it will be lovely to see you all again um, next month for our next All Stars session. And I will be teaching on uh, our E2 channels in an hour and a half. So I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for your participation. And I do wish you all every success uh, with your OET practice and preparation. And I always say to you, keep going one step at a time. You will get there. It is hard work, but it really is worth it. So keep going, keep enjoying your learning and see you soon. Thank you.